is the House Environment and Energy Committee. And this morning we're going to do a walkthrough of the latest version of S5, draft number 2.3, posted to our web page today with our Legislative Council, Ellen Tchaikovsky. Good morning, Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council. Yes, draft 2.3. Um, so the version on the website that is posted may be easier to read uh, because uh, during our last discussion, uh, you were, there was yellow, hide, yellow highlighting in draft 1.1 of the strike all. Um, you asked to keep those in to approve them in this draft. And so in yellow are the changes from the prior draft that are the same, but changes that are new to this draft are in blue highlighting. And um, on the internet, the blue is easy to read. When printed, it is less, it, the blue is darker than I was expecting. So I apologize. You requested pink. I thought the pink was too dark when printed, so I went with blue and I'm sorry. So here we are. So the first change in draft 2.3 is on page three. Um, uh, so in the intent section of the bill, it's adding to the intent that uh, the clean heat standard be designed and implemented in a manner that protects public health. So in addition to minimizing costs and recognizing affordable heat is essential, it's adding and protects public health. <laughs> the next change is on page four. Um, it's clarifying uh, the discussion uh, that we've been, you all have been having about uh, specifically how uh, obligated parties will uh, achieve their required credit amounts. So in uh, section, subsection C, uh, it's making just a clarification. So an obligated party shall obtain the required amount of clean heat credits through delivery of eligible clean heat measures by a default delivery agent unless the obligated party receives prior approval from the commission to use another method as described in section 8125 of this title. And so 8125, we will get to and see what that language is, but that's where the PUC will approve a plan to use another method. Okay. That's great. Yeah, that's good. So the next change is on page five. Uh, so it's uh, in the definition of customer with low income, and then the same language is added in the definition of customer with moderate income. The customer with low income means a customer with a household income up to 60% of the area or statewide median income, whichever is greater, as published annually by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or a customer who qualifies for a government-sponsored low-income energy subsidy. Uh, so I do think you discussed this change as part of the last. Representative Logan. Thank you. I'm not sure that the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development publishes information on the statewide median income. I could be wrong. So I did look into this and I was having a little trouble finding it on the HUD website, but I will say currently in statute, <clears throat> this language is used actually in Act 250 for the definition of affordable. It does cite the... HUD area median income or the HUD statewide median income. So um, I'd be happy to hear if anyone can confirm that, but that is what it says currently in Title 10 already. Um, and so then, as I just mentioned, customer with moderate income means a customer with a household income between 60% and 100% of the area or statewide median income, whichever is higher as published by HUD. Okay, so I think then those changes are good, but we need to confirm, and I think Kate is going to do that. If that data is still being compiled, maybe it, it may be an old reference. It could just be. Um, I know. So can I just ask process-wise, did you want to 
approve changes as we went over them? Yes. Or, okay. That would be good. So I think we've approved the ones we've gotten through so far. Okay. Uh, good, because that might mean that we are doing that. Okay. Representative, but I do have a question back. I was waiting on this on, on page four in C, which I think is great, but I but I'm not clear what the standard of review is. Right. So it's addressed directly in the other section. Oh, it's we got there. Okay. I do think you could take out this cross-reference if you want, because really this is just the introduction section. The process is spelled out in H125. <laughs> okay. Cross-reference cross is good because it'll answer folks who have that same question. Yeah. <clears throat> so the next change is on uh, page seven. Uh, uh, wait, oh, sorry. Did we already do number six on page five? I might have missed it. Yes. So um, it's the same language for customer with moderate income. Um, it's adding statewide uh, median income at whichever is greater as published by HUD. So the next change, uh, I don't think we've had too much discussion about, um, and there is, so I'll just read it. So on page seven, the definition of thermal sector Thermal sector has the same meaning as the residential, commercial, and industrial fuel sector, fuel use sector, as used in the Vermont Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory and Forecast, and does not include non-road diesel or any other transportation or other fuel use categorized elsewhere in the Vermont Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory and Forecast. Representative Stemmons. Thanks, Madam Chair. I think we did hear um, discussion about this. I know Rich Cowart um, in his testimony said that um, this, uh, this bill is only supposed to be applied to the thermal sector and not these this area, and that it was able to parse it out. And so I think if this helps clarify, I, I think that's helpful. If there are concerns that were being at all unclear, I think it's helpful. Agreed. I think this is good clarifying language. Um, and so th there's a related provision at the end of the bill related to this, um, asking to uh, the PUC to report <coughs> on if additional clarity on this is needed. So we'll get to that in section six. <coughs> I had a question about cooking, you know, gas used for cooking at the commercial scale and how that would be addressed. And I'm just bringing it now because it's not directly related to this, but related to it. It's got me thinking about it. So I, as far as I'm aware, cooking is part of the thermal sector yeah. in the greenhouse gas emissions. Right. And that, that's what I thought. But so, I mean, it, it, we would be then therefore would sort of a clean heat measure would be also helping this sort of commercial pieces with clarifying. It would be helping a restaurant, for example, convert to an induction range. Yes, and the appliances are on the list of eligible measures. Right, I just want to clarify. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, Representative Smith. We knew all that the best meals prepared at a restaurant are over propane. But anyway, I did have a question. If I may. Oh, you, you've used your question, Chip. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Smith. Thank you. Thank you, I think. Um, on page five, where to go here? Line five. Clean heat measure means fuel delivered and technologies uh, shall include switching from one fossil fuel to another. The least expensive way that myself, in my income bracket could go to a cleaner, more efficient heat would be to get rid of an old oil burner and replace it with a new oil burner. So I won't get any any kind of credits or any kind of uh, incentives to do that, will I? No. Representative Sebelia. So uh, in 
the case of a uh, Vermonter who has an old boiler um, who may not get an incentive to switch to a new fossil fuel boiler, there would be incentives envisioned around weatherization, which of course will make the most significant difference. Um, they could potentially be looking at um, some sort of biofuel. Um, and let me think if there are additional measures. Um, they could be looking at appliance. There, there are measures that would be available. And of course, we know that they also do not need to. Uh, they're not required to change their boiler. And if even if there's not an incentive for a more efficient boiler, um, putting one in would in fact lower their fossil fuel use and lower their exposure to um, the volatility and the pricing. So uh, this feels okay to me, even though it's not fossil, it doesn't allow fossil to fossil. There are still measures for folks who cannot switch fossil to fossil. Representative Stebbins. Thanks, Valentine. Um, yes, there's still measures uh, if people want to do them. I think the other piece is that um, uh, the concept as I understand it in this bill is to uh, motivate someone to take an action that they might not otherwise take. And so if you're gonna go and if your boiler breaks and you go and buy um, you know, the next available boiler, that is not motivating any change. That's exactly what you would have done otherwise. And I don't, I think if, if the concept here is to actually motivate shifting change, um, that action wouldn't be any form of change that you wouldn't do otherwise. Representative Pat, and then uh, just to add to that, if if one has uh, a boiler um, or a furnace, you know, central heating system in the house, and it needs to be replaced, uh, and, or, and let's say it burns oil or propane. Um, uh, an opportunity does exist uh, either with a furnace or a boiler, since that is the distribution system you have for heat in your house, um, to switch to uh, 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 a pellet uh, boiler or furnace. That, that is an option to consider. I, I keep mentioning it because it's what I ended up being confronted with. Um, it appears to me that the most efficient way for me to do something differently is to get rid of my oil burning furnace and put in something electric or something along that lines. But then I'm going to spend fifteen thousand or sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars instead of spending twelve or thirteen or fifteen hundred dollars to replace a more efficient heating system. And that doesn't seem quite fair to someone that's in. I'm not. I'm not in a high income or or a low income bracket, but. I'm in a bracket where I will get no assistance from anybody. And uh, that just seems a little bit discriminatory. Uh, if you, if someone in my income bracket can't get an opportunity to upgrade to the same type of a fuel system, it could be included in this bill. If, but if, if it can't be, it can't be. But I just want to bring that to the attention of the committee. Well, I think a lot of the clean heat measures are going to be available to everyone. So the you know, rebates and all of those things will still be available to anyone who has right. them. We'll see. Thank you. That's, yeah. Thank you. Representative Tory. Just very quickly, too. You bring up a, a really good point because most of us don't know when our furnaces or boilers might die on us. Sure. But a prudent thing for everyone to do is invest in the weatherization because that's going to get your costs down. Um, and you can spread out your costs instead of having to do everything at once, right? Um, and it can also affect the sizing that you need when you do make your change. Um, so the what I think a very important focus is the weatherization measures that are helpful for everyone. Sure, well, on absolutely. <laughs> weatherization is probably more important than changing your heating system, I would think. Uh, right now, my house is pretty airtight for an old 150-year-old timeout. But you're right. Thank you. <clears throat> I, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. As long as we're on that subject, I'd like to also just remind people that that boiler, when it fails or furnace, 
is still going to, if you, even if you switch to a heat pump with, to get the access to the incentive, still going to need to replace that boiler or furnace because uh, it needs to supplement during the cold weather, as I have found out with mine. I'm not talking about estimates or assumptions or anything. It's true. Uh, you have to have you have to have that supplemental heat when your initial one is not working effectively. All right, the, uh, page seven, I think you said, was the next. Uh, so <clears throat> the change on page seven was oh, in. Talked about that. Got it. Oh, and the change at the bottom of seven. Yes, we're accepting that. So then there are changes on page nine. Uh, related to the tax departments. Um, page eight is the next, in the right. middle, we should just, yeah. So we need, the yellow ones we need to revisit. Okay. Uh, so on page eight, uh, in subsection four, the commission may temporarily, for a period not to exceed 36 months, adjust the annual requirements for good cause after notice and opportunity for public process. Uh, in the prior version, it was 18 months. And then additionally, good cause may include a shortage of clean heat credits, market conditions as identified by the department's potential study con conducted pursuant to section 8125 of this title, or undue financial impacts on particular customers or demographic segments. This one? Yes. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> is this language in here in case this bill fails? No. What do you mean by fails? Well, they can temporarily uh, stop the process uh, and they can go to 36 months in the event that something doesn't go right, I guess, um, I'm trying to figure out. So it's adjusting the credit amounts. So I don't think they could fully stop the program. But if they identify a shortage of credits or market conditions or negative customer impacts, um, they could adjust the amount of credits that the obligated parties owe. What would cause that? Shortage of credits, market conditions, or negative impacts on customers. Okay, what could cause a shortage of credits? Uh, it could be workforce or material shortage. I, I don't know entirely, but perhaps. Okay. Thank you. Representative Sebelia. I will just note this, um, that this is one of two circuit breakers in the bill for um, you know, that are more important, I think, when we don't have a check back coming in. Um, you know, oh, these were sort of original. Well, they're, they're still important. Yes. Yeah. Um, they're still important. Yeah. Uh, these were part of uh, the first Bill, but give us the ability, you know, to say we we can reassure ourselves that if things are going haywire, we told the commission pause. Right. So it is for once the program is running. Yes. Um, if there's unforeseen circumstances, they can adjust the credit amounts. Representative Bonner. I the last sentence about well, shall not maturely affect. I, I don't know how you would adjust the credits without having them have a material effect. So, um, as with everything else in this bill, this is a, uh, a tension between the competing interests of not negatively infect, affecting Vermonters and meeting the goals of the, global, the requirements of the Global Warming Solutions Act. So, part of this is that it will be a temporary adjustment. The way that that may play out, depending on one of the options for the PUC in order to comply with the Global Warming Solutions Act, is that if they, if um, something happens, if there's a pandemic situation or something where the there are no credits available, work has stopped, uh, the PUC may say, okay, no one is required to have credits this year, but next year you may the credit amount may go up a bit to try to catch up. That is an option. It's not required, but it does ask the, P to the PUC to just, you know, evaluate if they're going to be on track um, with meeting the requirements. 
um, there are multiple places in this bill where it does ask the PUC to be monitoring mm -hmm. the credit amounts to see if they can move further on track with the Global Warming Solutions Act. So I'll just throw out there, would it possibly better for it to say, Commission shall ensure that any downward adjustment is the minimum amount necessary to deal with the situation? Because I don't get how that's not going to have a material effect. I hear what you said. I get it. Yes, you have options to change this paragraph to say whatever you want. Materially effect versus what, would, what did you put something on? like the minimum amount necessary to deal with the deal with the conditions, which is not <clears throat> for the board to create a better way to say that. But so, I think that we have provided. Um, some <coughs> flexibility um, in our in the goals we have in statute um, and the and and this bill with the potential study which allows us to look at um, what is available to us and so I think that this is I think this is okay um, so Mission shall ensure that any downward effect does not materially affect the state's ability to comply with the requirements. <clears throat> and so we have to put forward a plan and we have to um, make progress towards that plan. Representative Simmons. Okay. Um, uh, in my head, we have like two other relief valves. So maybe we can come back to this relief valve after, we, after we've revisited the language from the other two relief valves. Because I feel like combined, <coughs> we have multiple tools um, for the commission to uh, balance mm -hmm. those competing interests. So at this point, I'm, I'm okay with this language um, because I, in my head, we have those other relief valves that we're going to go through. One of which we, where's this the first one? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, we just have number four. Looking at different versions. Okay, I think good suggestion. Hold that thought. Thank you. Yeah, um, HUD does not publish uh, statewide median income data, they publish county level and area um, based on household size data. Um, but I, so I do believe that the place that um, Secretary Moore um, received that information from was the Vermont Tax Department and um, median statewide median income, but they don't publish. I just looked and they don't publish that in their annual tax statistics right now. Okay. So there's no, there are other very informal sources of that information on the internet, <laughs> but not from HUD or the state of Vermont. Go ahead. So, uh, <clears throat> We strike out the as published annually by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. Does that resolve this issue? Uh, let's read it again. Back to page five. So if you strike it, I think the PUC is going to have to address it on what source of data they're going to use. So I do think they could potentially address it in the rule. Um, the other option is you could move statewide to the end of the sentence or so that it's not covered by the HUD clause of that sentence, but um, there is probably going to need to be a, a, a unified definition. So if you leave in any ambiguity, I think the PUC is going to have to resolve it. So say again, Rep. Logan, what they do publish. They, they publish the area meeting. Right. Yep. 
So what if we strike or statewide? Um, that is more expansive, particularly for lower income <coughs> state. And, but then I was, but I was oh, going with what I didn't get to finish. What Ellen was going to say, I think, is then move statewide so that we still gather it. Although, who's where are we getting it from? statewide i think we'd have to ask the vermont department of taxes if they could provide that information for us and they you you found they currently provide it to anr well secretary moore um shared information about statewide median income the number of households in certain brackets of statewide median income and she said that she received that information from the Vermont Department of Taxes but we haven't communicated directly with them in any way. Yeah. Um, we have yeah, the commissioner. Yes. Oh right. Okay. So I think for now we need to find another figure out the source of the statewide data and remove it from the descriptor of the HUD data. Move it to the end. Yeah. Yeah, as I think Ellen was suggesting, I think that makes sense. Madam Chair, I, uh, if I, may, uh, I um, had a question on this earlier. I didn't ask that. I figured it, it'll come up later or whatever. But when we have, it seems like, multiple opportunities to find uh, low and medium income sources, uh, it would be advantageous, I think, if we would have what it is currently so that we would at least know who qualify, who would qualify. Oh, in here? Yeah, well, not in the bill, but uh, just so we can explain it. Uh, the people, constituents and such, uh, who, or myself, uh, who would be covered, mm -hmm. what income levels would qualify for the credit. Right, right. Okay, sure. <clears throat> All right, so moving on back to where we were. <clears throat> we're on page nine. Yes. So on page nine, there are two changes that relate to the tax department forms. And there is another change related at the end. Uh, so, so, so I'll start um, on page nine, subsection two. At a minimum, the commission shall require registration information. So this is the annual reg registration for all entities that sell heating fuel. So uh, registration information to include legal name, doing business as name, if applicable, municipality, state, types of heating fuel sold, the exact amount of gallons of each fuel type separated by type that was purchased by the submitting entity and the name and location of the entity from which it was purpose, uh, purchased, so a wholesaler potentially, and the volume of sales of heating fuels into or in the state for final sale or consumption in the state in the calendar year immediately preceding the calendar year in which the entity is registering with the commission. So uh, I admit this language maybe needs to be fixed a little bit, but um, this is leading up to sec uh, paragraph three that has the requirements on what the tax department would need to do are being struck. So this is asking, this is requiring that the PUC in their registration documents um, require all of the information that they're going to need. Um, and so breaking it out by exact amount of gallons per type, separated by type, and who they purchased from. Um, I think I need to maybe tweak the language. I think it's slightly redundant, but um, so that the tax department wouldn't be collecting that information, but the PUC would be. Representative Stebbins. I'm sure. Um, so is there a place here that the PUC can later on in the bill, is there a place where the PUC can check with the department of tax? Okay, great. Yes, yeah, so that's in section five. So I don't know if you wanna jump there now, um, but in the prior version, uh, there was language in section five about changing the, the confidentiality requirements of the tax department. <clears throat> and so now that language is slightly different, um, creating a slightly different process by which the PUC can verify its data with the department of taxes. Do you want to jump to that now? Okay. So section five is on page 36. Uh, and I only highlighted the section heading because I didn't, I wanted to make sure you could actually read all this language. 
So all the language in section five is new. So page 36, section five, this is a session law provision on confidentiality of fuel tax returns for 2024. So notwithstanding 32 BSA 3102A, which is the confidentiality provision for the tax department, from January 1, 2024 until December 31st, 2024, the Commission of Tax, the Commissioner of Taxes shall disclose to the Public Utility Commission and the Department of Public Service a return or return information related to the fuel tax imposed under 33 VSA 2503, provided the return or return information provided is necessary to verify the identity, fuel tax liability, and registration status of an entity that sells heating fuel into Vermont for purposes of administering the clean heat standard established in 30 VSA chapter 94. Pursuant to 32 VSA section 3102H, the person or persons receiving return or return information under this section shall be subject to the penalty provisions of 32 VSA 3102 for unauthorized disclosure of return or return information as such, as if such person were the agent of the commissioner. Pursuant to 32 VSA 30, 3102G, nothing in this section shall be construed to prohibit the publication of statistical information, rulings, determinations, reports, opinions, policies, or other information provided. The data is disclosed in a form that, can I, that cannot identify or be associated with a particular person. Pursuant to 1 VSA section 317C, Six, a fuel tax return and related documents, correspondence, and certain types of substantiating forms that include the same type of information as in the tax return itself with or maintained by the Vermont Department of Taxes disclosed to the Public Utility Commission and the Department of Public Service under this section shall be exempt from public inspection and copying. So this section was added um, to address the concerns that the tax department did bring in the other day. Yes, and so this language will allow um, for the year 2024 when they're setting up the system registering the fuel dealers for the uh, PUC to go and, and DPS to go to the Department of Taxes and request to verify information that the, the PUC has received against what the uh, Department of Taxes um, has without the Department of Taxes turning over all of the forms with the confidential information. <clears throat> Representative Simmons, yeah. Thanks. So uh, the dates from January 1, 2024 until December 31, 2024, so does that mean it ends? Yes, it's just the first. Yeah, so it's just for the initial um, first year and setting them up. So if there are new um, companies that start working, in 2025, um, the PUC wouldn't be able to ask the Department of Taxes whether or not they've captured them all? Uh, well, if a, if a brand new company is set up, they wouldn't necessarily have done any tax returns yet anyways. But I understand what you're saying. Um, yes, this is a time-limited provision. If you'd like to adjust that, I, I think you can consider that. I think the tax department has concerns about doing this type of process. So um, it's currently proposed to just doing it for one year, um, but it is a policy decision. I'm fine with these changes, I think they work. Yeah. Okay. So back to the front part of the bill, the earlier sections. Uh, the next change is on page 12. So I was a little bit confused based on the conversation we had last week about this section. So please let me know if I included the wrong changes. So on page 12, this is in the section about um, credits coming specifically from low income customers and moderate income customers. So of their annual requirement, 
Each obligated party shall retire at least 16% with customers from customers with low income and an additional 16% from customers with low or moderate income. Um, so I know you discussed this last week, but I actually wasn't sure if you were asking to add this or not. So if you tell me the equation. I think this captures what we talked yeah. about okay. and looking around mm -hmm. to see if it picks up okay. concerns about it. Thanks. Actually, before we move on, if everyone's okay with that, um, in the in the next um, subsection, the commission shall consider front loading the credit requirements for customers with low income and moderate income. We had discuss the possibility of striking the consider, just making it shall front load, especially <clears throat> given the federal yeah. resources available currently. Um, I apologize for- Ellen, I think we talked that through a little bit um, offline. So if you wanna share your where we got to, that'd be great. Sure, so this language, I actually think proceeds or uh, predates the 16 and 16 requirement. Um, before that was set, there was interest in making sure that more credits were provided for low and moderate income. Um, so I think this language, if you change, if you strike the word consider, I think that would slightly conflict with what you already have in the statute because you are saying 16% and 16%, but then asking the PUC to uh, have additional requirements in the rules that are greater than that 16%. Um, so uh, it just feels like a slight conflict, but if you want to, you can change it, but this is asking them to, to review that. Um, I think there is also the consideration that uh, the, the credits we're talking about will come from residential customers, which would include the low income and moderate income customers, as well as the commercial and industrial sector, which don't have low income and moderate income customers. So I think what you have currently is based on the balance of all those considerations. If you'd like to make a change, you can. Thank you. I would be comfortable with saying since the section two says at least 16%, um, and we know that there are a significant amount of federal funds that we don't know will be renewed after several years, I think we could probably say something like the commission shall to the greatest extent possible or something like that front load the credit requirements. Um, I think we've heard testimony that that would, um, that's clear direction from the legislature mm -hmm. um, and that with the federal funds that we have available, it is practically possible to do so, do that. And also given the testimony that we've received that um, industrial and commercial um, clean heat technology is not quite there yet. The majority of residential, uh, the majority of credits will be retired from residential projects probably in the initial years. So, the, so the commission, you're 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 proposing the commission shall, to the greatest extent possible, front load the credit requirements for customers with low and moderate income. Yeah, in the earlier years. Yep. I'm fine with that. I mean, I don't know that. Yeah, Representative Zucker. I just I wonder if possible might be too strong. Like that means sort of like if, if you could possibly do it, you, you should do it, even if there's some reason why maybe it's not a good idea to do it anyway, because it's possible. Maybe reasonable or mm. something like that. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> or feasible, 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 feasible. Reasonable feels like possible. <laughs> Reasonably possible. Yes, I do. This is a, a, another one that falls back to a question I asked in a previous meeting regarding the uh, uh, the upfront money and how we're going to init initially uh, roll out this program. Uh, the 16 percent we're talking about here for the low income and 16 percent for the moderate income is the floor only, correct? That's it's just a floor. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're saying we're going to consider front loading in number three. We don't have any money yet. How are we going to front load it? We do. From here, because I haven't seen any money actually tied to S5. The federal government. They tied it to S5? No, we are. We are? Yeah. It says. Within this bill? It's like 67 million or something. It's yeah. more than that. Um, all, yeah. So <clears throat> we have a tremendous amount of federal resources. We took testimony from the Department of Public um, Service about some of those $160 million in federal funds that would be applicable to clean heat measures. Um, and uh, we also, uh, I think Mr. Cowart may have, might have been Mr. Cowart that talked to us about, or uh, Mr. Westman, about the effect that that would have on a credit. Um, but that's a tremendous amount of uh, dollars. We have additionally, uh, it's $3 million in weatherization um, that, we've that we've allocated in federal funds. And so what those dollars are doing, um, they're, they're in action now. Um, they're available for uh, early credits. And so they're, they're kind of priming the market and they are making it uh, easier for compliance, actually, I, I believe, um, for our obligated parties because we have left, we have dollars that are here. So am I explaining this? Uh, yeah, so I understand the concept of what you're saying. And thank you for that, by the way. But I'm just also going to start. So just uh, we have a lot of federal money and it's being allocated in different pods. Yeah. And I'm just when if this S5 was to go through, yeah. Um, can point to that and say that's our money that's going to go towards this program. So it's buying clean heat measures now, things that would count as clean heat measures now, and we've provided in this bill for those to count as early action credits. So <clears throat> actually, you reminded me, we did get a list of the money uh, and yeah. a summary of it. So we should find that if you represent a Yeah, I mean, we also. Uh, and I can't recall if it was in the BAA or the budget. Yeah, no, so there was a five million or ten million for the healthy home or the clean home initiative. Um, we also have, you know, programs like Life Heap, and we have programs currently incentives currently being offered mm -hmm. for Efficiency Vermont. Um, we have incentive programs also currently be off, being offered, um, like Burlington Electric has. Um, you know, increased incentives for lower income Vermonters who install heat pumps or get an EV or something like that or an EV. So um, uh, I agree with you. It's not necessarily in this bill. Um, and I don't know, you know, you've mentioned this a few times. I don't know if it would be helpful to clarify like the types of money pots that are out there. Actually, it does say it yeah. in the findings. But um, there, there are many different pots of money that are currently in existence. If it's not enough, we will probably see that come up in the potential study. And if it's not enough, we also have those relief valves. I mean, the relief valve that we just saw, um, good cause may include a shortage of clean heat credits or undue adverse financial impacts. Um, so, um, I don't know if that's helpful. It is, and, and, and thank you for that. So if, if uh, S5 passes and those pots of money will be used to stand this program up. They can't. Credits. 
they count. count. They won't be used to stand the program up. So the only appropriation to stand this up is funding right now for the department and the PUC for staffing and their facilitators. But these programs that are already, this, this is from the Department of Public Service testimony that we took from TJ Poor, I think a week and a half ago, this slide. This is part of the dollars Representative Stebbins was talking about others. <clears throat> so they'll count towards this. These are gonna happen anyways. Uh, they are effectiveness when we enact this is to help smooth the transition for our, our obligated parties. So just while we're on this uh, three, uh, I would suggest that we say the commission shall come up to the extent possible come up from both of whatever departments. I don't think we want to be too prescriptive. Mm -hmm. And um, but this is a lot stronger than shall consider mm -hmm. shall to the extent it is possible something. I think it gets kind of where we're trying to go, but without being this it might be opportunities that we're not seeing yet that and so anyway, I suggest no. that. Did you catch that on? Right. So just a question on um, does that give the P that still gives the P C discussion? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the next change is on is still on page 12 in subsection four. So uh, it's this was in the prior draft. It's striking con consultation with the equity advisory group. So this is the other one of the other circuit breakers. So with consideration to how to best serve customers with low income and moderate income, the commission shall have authority to change the percentages established in subdivision two, which are the credits from low and moderate income customers for good cause after notice and opportunity for public process. Good cause may include shortage of community credits or undue financial impact on particular customers or demographic segments. So uh, this draft, in the prior draft, the equity advisory group was struck entirely. This draft is setting up a slightly different construct with having this equity advisory group sunset. Um, so this provision uh, with this circuit breaker is a long-term one. And so the equity advisory group likely won't exist unless that sunset is uh, reestablished. Uh, Representative Sibelia. I cannot recall if we had this discussion in four with consideration on how to best serve customers with low income and moderate income. The commission should have the authority to, um, I think there was a suggestion <laughs> that we say increase. You did have that discussion. Thank you. So why would you, if, okay, so this section goes on to say good cause is harm. So it's shortage or financial impacts. And so why would the commission increase credits based on that information? So if you're going to change that, you probably should change what good cause means. Additionally, there's the language in five. So we, you did, we did have this discussion last week. Um, now we're calling. Okay. Thanks. Then I'm fine. We'll leave it. Yeah. yeah. So on page 13, related to that, there is new language in subdivision five to hopefully clarify it. So in determining whether to exceed the minimum percentages of clean heat measures that must be included to customers with low income and moderate income, the commission shall take into account participation in other government sponsored low income and moderate income weatherization programs. Participation in other government sponsored low income and moderate income weatherization programs shall not limit the ability of those households to participate in programs under this chapter. Uh, so that's consistent with what the intent was, but if this helps clarify that. Great. Uh, 
Okay, on to page 14. Um, on page 14, the non-compliance payment amount has been changed from four times to three times the amount of the credit price. And then additionally, that language that you discussed last week is in here. So um, the commission shall order an obligated party that fails to retire the required amount um, to pay a non-compliance payment of three times the amount. Um, however, in number three, the commission may waive the non-compliance payment required by subdivision two uh, for an obligated party if the commission finds that the obligated party made a good faith effort to acquire the required amount and, is, and its failure resulted from market factors beyond its control and directed the obli directs the obligated party to add the number of credits deficient to one or more future years. Oh, and that's not exactly the language that you proposed, but I made the grammar, I think, a little more clear. <laughs> Just smoothed it out a little bit. Like this. Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Um, on page 15, the numbers before we move. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to voice my opinion again that um, our intent is not to put them out of business and this three times payment could and now we've added language that says it may be waived. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm just concerned that uh, going to lose some uh, fossil fuel delivery agents, obligated parties, uh, trying to be obligated parties that are fulfilling a need to our, uh, our their customers and our constituents. That, and I appreciate adding the language that gives the PUC opportunity to work with them, perhaps. But I, I'm still struggling with the three times. Yeah, I just think that's an, uh, an amazing penalty. And I get it where it came from, from previous uh, legislation or ideas. Just voicing an opinion. So uh, I would just respond that the credit price has not been set. And that is one of the things that the rules will set when you receive them in 2025 for review. Um, and so at that point, you will have more information on what a compliance payment would look like because you'll have the credit price amount. Thank you. Representative Smith. You think that perhaps we should wait to vote on the bill until we know exactly what it's going to be, how it's going to be applied to everything? Well, if you don't vote on the bill, there's no directive for anyone to figure that out. Exactly. Thank you. And it's the so I, I would like us to figure it out and then come back and vote on it. Therefore, I think we need to vote the bill. <laughs> Representative Stevens. Well, and furthermore, you know, this again, this is not the first time we've done this. We we established the renewable energy standard for the credits and the you know, alternative compliance payment and other economic determinations weren't set um, before putting the program into place, um, or rather when we were voting on the bill. Uh, and I think that's kind of how it has to be because uh, energy prices are going up and down and up and down. So I don't, I don't know how we could possibly <clears throat> set it and then stay forever because that's not at that price because that's not what's going on with energy market prices. Going on, Representative Bonner. Just reading two, literally. We could read it in response to say that if you fall just short, you get charged three times the entire amount deal, even if you did some of them. It doesn't say for the unfulfilled credit <laughs> hmm. anywhere. Hmm. <laughs> I was just wanting to uh, thank you for bringing that up, if I may, Madam Chair, uh, to comment on that as well is, is uh, this, this penalty is set up for those that are not participating or fail to hire them credits. Uh, that's going to include the uh, obligated parties that are 
perhaps doing installations of alternative measures, but maybe not to the level that's required, or well, they're also going to be penalized. <laughs> so you, if I'm reading this correctly, you could on line nine, when it says to make a non-compliance payment for the unfulfilled credits to the default agent, because you could, anyway, I've already said it. Yeah, non-compliance payment for the unfulfilled credits. Seems good to me. Representative Sibelia. Yeah, just wondering uh, if Ledge Council has any comment on the effect of doing that. Um, so I would just say that the PUC is the enforcement entity here, and as with any enforcement mechanism, the PUC will have discretion to enforce to the extent that they see fit. Um, this is how other enforcement authority works. Um, so if you'd like to be more clear here, you can. I do not think this, this language is tying their hands. Uh, I think that they have, I think that this language asserts your intent on what things are, but they will have enforcement authority at the end of the day to set the penalty. Um, so if you'd like to be uh, adjusting the language here, you can, but at the end of the day, the PUC will have the authority to set the penalty. So I like Representative Bongart's suggestion, as long as it's not kind of shifting uh, anything really significantly. It's just adding clarity. <clears throat> I mean, I, I appreciate the discussion. So that, I think we should put that in there. <clears throat> this is a whole different idea, but I don't like finding any businesses for anything if they're working hard to try to do the right thing. And uh, I agree with Representative Morris. Well, even more so than what he, what he said about this three times. But we just can't keep charging or are finding Vermonters that are working hard, but this this does, and I'm disappointed in it. <clears throat> that enough, Sevilla? Yeah. Um, Alan, can you tell me, with the language as we have it, with the addition of Representative Bond Guards, or without, uh, if... Um, if uh, an entity um, came in and had been making an effort, um, had notified the PUC, um, you know, had followed the steps, registered, notified the PUC of what they were, you know, how they were going to be able to comply, and they fell short, um, is it possible that the PUC could not charge them? Um, that they could come up with some other um, means of dealing with that? Is it possible that they could say there is no fine? I think so. Um, and I think that that is common in what other agencies do. Um, they first ask for the party that's in violation to attempt to cure the violation before they require the penalty payment. Um, so I do think they still have that authority, um, especially because the default provision here is their existing authority under Title 30. Um, so, yes, I do think that's a possibility. If if there's concern about the word shall on line six, you could change that. Um, but it does really depend on what your intent is. Just to say, if we had those words that I suggested, I'm fine with it. Thank you. If we do want to mean it on the one hand, on the other hand, we want to give some, as long as we clarify that it's for our football credits, we've done a pretty good job with this language. Can you read them again to me? Is it at the end of the first sentence no, or the second right. sentence? Line nine. Okay. Um, yep. To make a non compliant compliance payment um, uh, for the unfulfilled, that doesn't mean for the unfulfilled credits okay. to the default.
I think that works. Yeah. All right. I think we've got a tremendous amount of flexibility here, and um, it's good. Um, next is on 16, I think. Yes. Uh, so at the bottom of page 16, so now we're in the section on the default delivery agent. Um, this change was in the prior draft, and it's requiring that we designate the first default delivery agent um, by June 1st, 2024. Yes. Uh, so the next change is on page 18, still in regard to the default delivery agent. This um, uh, is related to language I mentioned at the beginning of this draft. So in uh, starting on line nine, an obligated party shall meet its annual requirement through a designated default delivery agent appointed by the commission. However, the obligated party may uh, meet, uh, may seek to meet its requirement in whole or in part through one or more of the following ways, by delivering eligible clean heat measures, by contracting for delivery of eligible clean heat measures, or through the market purchase of, of uh, clean heat credits. An obligated party shall be approved by the commission to meet its annual requirement using a method other than the default delivery agent if it provides sufficient details on the party's capacity and resources to achieve the emissions reduction. <laughs> So they may go through this other route, and if they provide sufficient detail, the PUC must it will approve their plan. So this provides flexibility for the obligated parties, uh, those um, that are providing clean heat measures um, to like Brian Gray, who we heard from. You know, here's how we're going to do it. Uh, They've demonstrated they have the capacity, the resources to do it. The PUC will say, great. Um, or to elect that they're going to use the DDA um, to deliver the clean heat measures. I think this works. I would just say importantly here, we're providing some clarity for the fuel dealers themselves to do some planning um, that the PUC um, is that the PUC is not going to be able to surprise. We're not going to, you know, it's going to be really hard for you to um, do these on your own. Uh, basically, we're saying here that if you have the resources, uh, the ability to demonstrate you have the capacity to do this, you'll be able to do it yourself. Yeah, it's setting some standards for what they need to demonstrate in order to do this. All right. Uh, so also on page 18, down on line 20, uh, related to this provision. So the commission shall provide a form for an obligated party to indicate how it intends to meet its, uh, its requirement. Oh, and I guess I should probably keep reading. So the form shall require sufficient information to determine the nature of the credits that the default delivery agent will be responsible to deliver on behalf of the obligated party. If the commission approves of a plan for an obligated party to meet its obligation through a mechanism other than payment to a default delivery agent, then the commission shall make such approvals known to the default delivery agent as soon as practicable. So making sure that the DDA knows how many credits as soon as, as, soon as practical that they're gonna to need to uh, generate. Uh, next. So on page 19, the mission shall by rule or order establish a standard timeline under which the default delivery agent credit costs or costs are established and by which uh, an obligated party must file its form. 
The default delivery agent's schedule of costs shall include sufficient costs to deliver installed measures and shall specify separately the costs to deliver measures to customers with low income and customers with moderate income as required to subsection 24, uh, 8124D of this title. Um, so I think this was already implicit, but it's making further clear um, the, the credit for, uh, for low income customers and moderate income customers will probably cost different amounts based on the cost share required. Um, so uh, the schedule of costs need to uh, address that. Representative Sibelia. Yeah, this, uh, this language um, I think is helpful and uh, a lot of parties have been working to kind of make sure that we're accounting for um, counting for this. So I'm really happy with this language. All right, so. Uh, just, uh, uh, can I ask for a clarification? Yes. Um, the default delivery agent can be an in-state or out-of-state company? Um, it doesn't specify. Doesn't specify, yeah. Yeah. But we, we do have companies out of state that deliver into the mall that probably would qualify for installation of alternatives. And I, I just we don't want to exclude them or. I don't think we could. Yeah. Legally. So. Right. A couple more, and then we'll take a break. So at the top of page 20, uh, I do think this is also a clarification, and this came from the discussion last week. So clean heat credits generated through installed measures delivered by the default delivery agent on behalf of an obligated party are creditable in future years. Those credits not required to meet the obligated party's existing obligations shall be owned by the obligated party. Uh, so an installed measure has a measure life probably somewhere 10 to 12 to 15 years. So it will generate credit in every year that it's uh, installed. Uh, if at some point the obligated party has more credits that it needs to in a year, um, those credits that have been installed by the, based on the DDA's work um, can be retained by the obligated party. Uh, I would like to propose adding a few words here. Okay. Uh, so clean heat credits generated through installed measures delivered by the default delivery agent on behalf of an obligated party that are creditable in future years and are not required to meet the obligated party's existing obligations shall be owned by the obligated party. So that's the language you originally proposed. And I changed it because I thought it was very confusing. So I think my language says the same thing. If you'd like to go back to that language, that's fine. I thought the break of the sentence helps. If it doesn't, we can use, you can go back to that language. Oh. I think it's mind boggling anyway. <laughs> That's not required to make it. I think um, this was the section that I said uh, the way I had been reading the language that you just proposed, Representative Sebelia. Um, was that it seemed as though it could be binding future years, meaning if an obligated party wanted to actually say, here, you can have all my credits for the next 10 years because I would rather just do this and be done in year one or whatever, whatever that negotiated agreement was, I 
read the language that we had originally had in the last round as saying that they couldn't make that decision if they wanted to. And so I think um, I think this was your attempt to like make it clearer that it's up to the obligated party. If they want to keep it, they can negotiate that. If they want to trade it in in future years, they can negotiate that. But it, that it's the negotiation is up to the obligated party with the PDA. Am I summarizing that correctly? Yeah, uh, that was part of the discussion. Um, so I think either way, this is a slightly verbose sentence either way. So if the prior language is more clear, that's fine with me. Um, I, maybe it's uh, that last sentence, those credits not required to meet the obligated party's existing obligations. <laughs> may or may not be owned by the obligated party, depending on what the obligated party wants. I don't know. I just don't want to make sure that the negotiation, negotiation is flexible. And I didn't, the last version, I did not read to me to be flexible. Yeah, so I guess you could add words at the end of that sentence, owned by the obligated party, to do with what they wish. Right. It sounds like this is setting up arbitrage. Right. But I mean, we sure. need to articulate that further. Okay, so under currently with RECs, um, arbitrage is when a REC, uh, they're unbundled and they can be sold for, if a, if a utility has them and they don't currently need to uh, retire them for their amounts, they can sell them to other people. Um, and that would result in revenue for the utility. Um, and so, and then they can then use that revenue to either buy cheaper RECs or do additional uh, renewable generation. So it's setting up flexibility and the buying and the selling not requiring retiring. Yeah. Yeah. And really where I was going with this the last round, the way I read it was, if an obligated party says, here are my credits for this year, and if they wanted to also say, and here are my credits for next year, that they couldn't do that. That's how I read the language last year. But if I'm the only one, I'm fine to drop it. Representative Sibeli, I'm actually fine with the language that you proposed. That Ellen proposed? I'm, yeah, I'm okay. going to withdraw my suggested changes. All right. All right. I think with that, we'll take a break. All right. We're going to reconvene our meeting and continue our walkthrough of S5 version 2.3. Okay. So on page 20, <clears throat> so uh, sub, subdivision E talks about the budget for the default delivery agent. <clears throat> so there's some new language in here regarding the potential study. Uh, but to start with line six, the commission shall open a proceeding on or before July 1, 2023, and at least every three years thereafter <clears throat> to establish the default delivery agent credit cost or costs and the, con the quantity of credits to be generated for the subsequent three-year period. That proceeding shall include a potential study conducted by the Department of Public Service, the first of which shall be completed no later than September 1, 2024, to include an assessment and quantification of technically available, maximum achievable, and program achievable thermal resources. The results shall include a comparison of the legal obligations of the thermal sector portion of the requirements of 10 VSA 578A2 and 3. The potential study shall consider and evaluate market conditions for <coughs> delivery of clean measures within the state, including an assessment of workforce characteristics capable of meeting consumer demand and meeting the obligations of 578A2 and 3. So I think I'll stop there, unless you want me to read the next paragraph and then go back. Sure, let's go through. Um, so the top of page 21 is still on the same topic. The development of a three-year plan and associated proposed budget by the default delivery agent to be informed by the final results of the department's potential study. 
the default delivery agent may propose a portion of its budget towards promotion and market uplift, workforce development, and trainings for clean heat measures. Um, so there's a couple of new things from yesterday. Um, there's obviously the additional detail of what the potential study should focus on, but I did also include a completion date for the first one of September 1, 2024. Representative Logan. Thanks. I have a question. Um, I'll just state this uh, language in B looks good to me. And then in a potential study, um, would the potential the consideration and evaluation of market conditions for delivery of clean heat measures within the state, um, will that also include a market analysis of what we expect to be the extent to which the biofuels market will expand in the state? Or is it entirely focused? It's, yeah. it's entirely focused on estimating the cost, but not on the effects on certain markets that the policy will have. Correct? Is there another part? I feel like we have a lot of different pieces where there's reflection and reporting back that needs to be done, and I'm personally curious to know what impact. The Affordable Heat Act will have on the long term expansion of the biofuel industry in Vermont and which biofuels in particular would be able to meet the standard. Yeah. But I don't know that there's where does, a. Where does that come out? Yeah, where does that come out? Representative Sebelia. I don't think that would be. Technically available, maximum achievable. So I'm not sure that that's what the potential study covers. Um, I will say there are two other places that I think it comes up under the review of consequences section. Um, and then also under the tags uh, list of provisions, it isn't as specific as what you were just saying, but they're supposed to review the sustainability of the production of clean heat measures. Um, and so uh, including land use changes and ecological and biodiversity impacts. And so I think that's what you're talking about a little bit, but I'm not sure. Is that, so when we get to those sections. Yeah. Keep an eye out. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, I would just note the um, potential study. Um, the addition of a date, I think, is important here. Yeah. I think certain. So, mm. yeah. yeah, it's good. Moving on. Okay. Uh, so, on page twenty-one. Once the commission provides the default delivery agent with the obligated party's plan to meet the requirements, the default delivery agent shall be granted the opportunity to amend its plan and budget before the commission. So just changing what the form was called. Uh, and then uh, on still on page 21, subsection G, so the default delivery agent shall create specific programs for multi-unit dwellings, condominium associations, rental properties, commercial and industrial customers and manufactured homes. So these groups have an, an equitable opportunity to benefit from the clean heat standard. And I'm wondering if it actually should be commercial and industrial buildings, since the rest of that sentence is kind of about building type. I had that before, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Representative Tory. It's a little wordsmith thing. Um, the word groups on line 17, because you're talking about buildings, but oh, sure. would you instead change it to building types or? Sure. Where, what did mm -hmm. you say, Ed? On line 17, so these building types have an equitable opportunity to benefit? Yeah. 
Condominium association is not a building type. Right. Right. And yeah. Yeah, condominiums. And, yeah. and buildings don't have, need equity, say. Right. <laughs> yeah, the groups needs to be. This does, we talked about lining this up before. I think yes. it's a little more lining up and representative civilian. Uh, so, yeah, I think we were kind of stumbling around here. Um, what if we, uh, I think we want to make sure they have an opportunity to benefit. I, mm. Maybe we just take out that group. Or, or what, uh, uh, if it's mm. okay, Madam Chair, the other thing, I mean, you could, you could specify the building types and then you could like qualify that the occupants of these building types mm. yeah. have an equitable That's opportunity. It. Yeah, so it could be uh, create specific yeah. programs for owners and occupiers of uh, multi unit condominiums, rental. Occupunch. Uh, versus and versus and occupants. Occupants. Or so these groups have an equitable. Or owners or occupants. Uh, Representative Sevilla. Uh, what if we were to uh, default delivery agents shall create specific programs for multi unit dwellings, condominium associations, rental properties, commercial and industrial buildings, and for manufactured homes? Period. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. What's wrong with that? That's fine. That's fine with me. Uh, yeah, I guess it's fine. It was the big um, But yeah, mm -hmm. the point of this was be this. I believe the history is it was before the other low income parts of the bill were added, and that's why I have a note that says, "Is this necessary?" Mm -hmm. Like. And then we talked about adding the commercial. I understand we had that conversation, but I just, um, yeah. Representative Sibelia. No, I think that, well, I think the commercial and industrial is necessary. <clears throat> That's, this was a business request. Right. To add them in. Okay. So, all right. I'm fine with the suggested change of Representative Logan. Is there another place where we discuss tenant access to yeah. programs? Yeah, yeah, we'll get to it. I think we did. There is. Or we already, I think it's before. I'm sorry. Yes, we kind of reference renters. I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but I do believe they are mentioned elsewhere. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. Page one. Uh, it's not page one. But it's uh, around page 11 under the equitable distribution of clean heat measures, mm -hmm. number one. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, shortening the sentence. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have more to say on that? Uh, I just was, so am I changing industrial cus customers to buildings? Yeah. Okay. And then something should happen to condominium associations. Condominiums. Condominiums. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so on page 22, now this is the rulemaking section, the statutory provision for rulemaking. Um, so uh, subsection B, the requirements to adopt rules and any requirements regarding the need for legislative approval before any part of the clean heat standard goes into effect, do not in any way impair the commission's authority to issue orders or any other actions before and after the final rules take effect.
Uh, and then farther down. Question. Nope, this was just reminding us that this was just part of making sure that the commission can actually do the work to get us to the place where we can make a decision as to whether or not we want to go forward. So then under subsection C, there was this addition from the Office of Racial Equity. So, um, so the commission's rule shall include a provision that allows the commission to revise its clean standard rules by order, by order of the commission, <clears throat> without revision being subject to the rulemaking requirement of the APA, provided the commission provides notice of any proposed changes, allows for a 30-day comment period, Response to all comments received on the proposed changes, provides a notice of language assistance services on all public outreach materials, and arranges for language assistance to be provided to members of the public as requested using professional language services companies. Yes. <clears throat> On page 23, now in the section on uh, clean heat credits. Uh, so there's some strikeouts in the credit ownership section. So the commission in consultation with a technical advisory group shall establish a standard methodology for determining what party or parties shall be the owner of a clean heat credit upon its creation. The owner or owners may transfer those credits to a third party or to an obligated party. Um, so, uh, part of, so some of this language that's being struck was added into the potential study, as you, we heard, we talked about a minute ago. Um, so that's where the market uplift and workforce development will be addressed is in the, the budgeting process for the DDA. Is this language really to the other conversation we had about who owns the original credits? Yeah, prior. So this is allowing the PUC to define the rule, how to determine who the owner of a credit is. Okay. And the so the the other language that we talked about previously would need to be uh, would dictate what their rules say would say. So the rules are going to be governed by the, all the provisions of the statute. So they'll need to be consistent with that as well. Right, and that yeah. And so in the previous language that we talked about that is connected here, what is happening there is that uh, a uh, obligated party will have an obligation that they need to meet. They may elect to have the DDA um, uh, provide the measures, do the measures. Um, and some of those measures are gonna have a long life. And so uh, after three years, I believe it is right that that long life will still it still counts towards their obligation that's good in the previous section we're clear that it still counts towards their ongoing obligations that, that uh, they they continue to receive benefit credit uh, for that long life uh, long delivering clean heat measure so it, it's reducing their um, obligation in future years. So some measures are better than other measures to install. So if you're installing something that um, has a lot, really, uh, it's a lot lower emissions to a low income um, in, in building, qualified building, it's probably going to, I, I, now I'm going too far. Yeah. I'm going too far. I get that. Thanks. Well, I'm looking at Representative Morris. Uh, 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 but if I may, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, they retain the credit because it's a long-term commitment. <clears throat> Each year, they're going to have... That's not going to... Say they had 100% of their credits earned in the first year. That's not going to... They don't have to stop installing or retiring additional credits in future years. They have to continue to earn. Or... It's based on how much fuel they're selling. 
you know, their obligation, that will be a part of the calculation of their obligation. So, you know, you're selling this, you're selling this much fuel, therefore you're obligated to help offset that the emissions there with this many measures. And let's look at what previous measures you um, caused to be, maybe through the DDA, and we'll subtract that from your obligation. That's helpful towards meeting your obligation. Correct, but if they did 100% in one year, theoretically, if they sold all their, if they sold their required credits in the first year, that's not gonna prevent them from having to, that's not gonna prevent them from having to install others or give them permission to not install in future year because those credits would, might, might. Yeah, yep, um, but if they did all installed measures as opposed to selling biofuels, which only last one year, um, they're only going to need to cover the delta for the next year, right? So if the increase in the next year is only 1%, they're going to only need to make up that 1%. But if they did biofuels, that wouldn't be the case. They're doing installed somebody's doing installed measures that and you get 115 for a year or whatever it is mm -hmm. of the life is it going to be hard to hit it the first year why hit the target because you get such a small amount in the first year and we have 115 or whatever no that's not right no because it starts the credits can start accruing this year as of three months ago so, so that's part of the concept that's part of the concept just to get you to that yes. okay and also the calculation isn't maybe that narrow. It's going to include the emissions reductions achieved in that year. So I don't know if it would be 115th per se, but. Um, it would be a portion. It would be the emissions reductions achieved in that year by that measure. And then each year that amount <laughs> until it hits the sort of diminishing return at the end of the life. So it's not 115th of a credit. It's the credit based on the amount of emissions reduction in that year. <coughs> okay, that makes sense. Okay, I got could it. You, could you also then have enough ongoing credits every year that would offset your requirement? Not do any more. So it's an interesting question because we don't know the pace at which the annual requirement will be set. So it's a, yeah, it's a little bit of an open question. I think it might have been better worded the way you said it. <laughs> that makes sense. Plus, the three years makes sense to you. That all makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> so on, oh, it's in Keep going, we're not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> So on page 24 now, uh, we're in the section on the, the clean heat measures. Uh, so subsection D sets up the list of eligible clean heat measures. So uh, eligible clean heat measures delivered to or installed in Vermont shall include. Um, as passed the Senate, it was shall. The last version had may. This goes back to shall. Uh, happy to discuss those issues. And then number one adds the words residential, commercial, and industrial, thermal energy efficiency improvements and weatherization. And it also adds those three words on the next page. And so I was wondering if it would be more succinct to say in subsection D, eligible clean heat measures delivered to or installed in hmm. residential, uh, residential, commercial, and industrial buildings in Vermont shall include. No, because there's the fuel sources too. Yeah. On the list. Well, or shall it's include. delivered to or installed in. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, uh, maybe Representative Sibeli. So does that then would that obligate us to offer um <clears throat> a uh industrial or commercial solar hot water system as a measure? 
Yes. Were you not envisioning that as an eligible clean heat measure currently? For commercial and industrial? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you, so yes, if you want to be specific, uh, I'd say leave it the way it is. I don't, I don't think, I, I don't, with number eight and number 12, I don't, under, I don't think you can put residential, commercial, industrial into little d. Well, 12 has residential, commercial, and industrial. Yeah, right. right. But so the I, line extension is to a residential, commercial, industrial building. It's oh. not this. And if you're talking about a district heating service, it's not technically in the building. I and mean, I, I think this... It is in and out of the buildings. Well, it's okay. Sure. I think I could come up with a way to fix the grammar, but I guess the, the real question is, are you only identifying these RCI for the specific measures on the list? Yeah, that's <laughs> For all of them. Right. Yeah. Representative Sibelia. Now, all of them may not be currently feasible for all residential, commercial, and industrial types, but. Right, which makes child problematic. Well, mm -hmm. not if it's, an, if it's not even available, no one's going to try to install it. <clears throat> Eligible measures shall include. Okay, right. Oh, represent seconds. Are there options other than residential, commercial, and industrial? Right, because if not, then if that's everybody, then why do we even need it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, the, uh, the line improvements for connecting residential. So the addition in one and six is a request of business generally. Uh, Business interests generally that came in. Uh, some clarification that for sure these would benefit them. And uh, 12 is um, rural interests. So things like sugar shack. Um, and well, I, I understand that. I'm just saying, like, if what is it? Is it adding anything? Is it or it's like okay, to make it harder for us to say it, what we want to say? And possibly. Begs the question on the other ones if it's only on a few of them. Doesn't it's Representative Logan? Thank you. Um, I'd say that re residential, commercial, and industrial does not include public buildings. Commercial, mm -hmm. industrial, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Representative, Pat. Well, I was just going to say something about that because um, in in the utility world, a, a a school or a public building is considered a commercial account because it looks the usage and it looks and the, the building similar. itself is similar to a commercial. So there isn't a distinction, at least in in that uh, in that regard. So when I read commercial, um, I'm I'm including public buildings uh, in, in that. But it, if it's not clear, it could, that could be added. <laughs> Public buildings and facilities, or, or whatever. And if Logan then Sibelia. I'm, it just seems confusing, except for twelve mm -hmm. potentially. Yeah, I'm fine with Ellen's suggestion to add. I think being yeah. specific in there is helpful for Vermonters to understand. Yeah. It's all sectors of the bill. It's redundant. It's not really necessary, but it's helpful for people to see that. Yes, we met you too. So we're putting it at the beginning. Yes. Yeah. Right. Representative Smith. I want to make, is this a good time or a bad time to ask a question in general about this bill? Well, we are trying to get through the walkthrough in a timely fashion. So okay, I guess well, I would ask. Then I'm going to ask the question and you can tell me if we want to wait until later. Okay. But what effect will this bill have on Vermont's maple sugar industry? As far as you know, these sugar houses that burn made me think of it. Uh, burning uh, 
fuel oil or propane, uh, are they going to be able to sustain? That's why 12 was added. Yeah. Is to make sure they are included. Okay. So that's a discussion that we're going to have to have probably in length at some point, I think, because it's going to cost them a lot more money, I believe. Uh, represents really so 12. <laughs> He's saying you. that uh, we would you know, twelve is specifically to try and offset um, to try to try and allow those types of buildings opportunities uh, to reduce their fossil fuel usage to include them. How, so you're you're allowing a line extension. How will they reduce fossil fuel usage? when they depend on fossil fuel to generate quantities of maple syrup. So there may be other things in there, maybe lights, uh, other propane, bay, who knows? Um, there may be other measures that they can take. Okay. No, thank you. Yeah, I didn't mean to hold you up here. So. Representative Logan. Thank you, Chair. Um, if we could just uh, pause for a moment to look at number eight, non-combustion or renewable energy-based district heating services. I don't know if the other representative from Burlington has heard quite a bit about <clears throat> from constituents about um, district heating as a clean heat measure. And I wanted to just, before we move along, Take a moment to um, ensure that we that we believe S five is sufficiently structured to uh, provide a sufficient review to the carbon emissions implications of, <coughs> for example, district heating projects under consideration. Representative Stebbin, thanks, Madam Chair. I, I I mean I think so because it goes through. The it requires the full life cycle analysis. So uh, in comparison to some of the other analyses that we do um, for the state of Vermont for this program, it would be the full life cycle. Including, for example, backup generation sources that might be required in order to enable a district heating program. Backup. You know, like or, natural gas, for example. You mean like supplementary heating for it or backup? Um, backup energy. So this will calculate the energy required also to... It would be the full, I mean, if they're proposing right. a project, it would be the full analysis. Does that answer your question? It does. I think that... That's the best that we can possibly do is to provide options, but also really strict requirements in terms of um, the analysis that needs to be done on any given project that could be considered a clean heat measure. Right, consistency across the types of fuels being used. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think is the intention of the life cycle analysis. Mm -hmm. so that's what I've pursued. And the review of consequences. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. And sustainability. Mm -hmm. Okay. So on page 25, um, I think <coughs> we're just discussing it, but line extensions that connect residential, commercial, or industrial customer uh, facilities with thermal loads to the grid is the new um, item on the list of eligible measures. Tori. I just wonder, I mean, industrial probably captures it, but is there any harm in calling out agricultural? Um, just that, I mean, we're only raising it now. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. and so if, if the so going to what Representative Pat said, um, when, for example, Efficiency Vermont is looking at a custom incentive, um, an agricultural building, uh, 
barn or a you know would be would fall into the area of um, usually commercial, depending on what the size would be. So a sugar shack. Representative Pat. I mean, we, we can go around and around on the definitions here, but to me, um, the, the making of maple syrup is a commercial uh, activity, not an agricultural activity. The processing of an agricultural product comes at commercial or industrial yeah. activity. I mean, you can, we can talk forever about where, where the line is, but in that case, that's, that's how I would define it. Yeah, I think it's pretty inclusive. We should move on. The next change is on page 27. Uh, in determining the baseline emission rates for clean heat measures that are fuels, emission baselines shall fully account for methane, emission inspections or captures already occurring or expected to occur for each fuel pathway as a result of local, state, or federal legal requirements that have been enacted or adopted that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Page 27. I know, emission schedule section G. What is the, that reduced greenhouse gas emissions adding? So, this is uh, received to testimony, I think. I was. And we will require. So this is sort of the requirements of the land of a landfill or a, to be captured. And so this is um, this is the avoiding double counting. <coughs> That's the intention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So if they're already required to be doing this work, they're not going to get clean credits for that. Okay. Is there a more direct way of just saying what you just said? Like, it's a long time to get there. Right? <laughs> but, uh, I'm hesitant to try to because I think this came. From advocates who know more about methane than I do. Okay. All right. Other questions on this? No. Moving on. All right. Review of consequences. The commission shall biennially assess harmful consequences that may arise in Vermont or elsewhere from the implementation of specific types of clean heat measures and shall set standards or limits to prevent those consequences. Such consequences shall include public health, deforestation or forest degradation, conversion of grasslands, increased emissions of criteria pollutants, damage to watersheds, or the creation of new methane to meet fuel demand. So um, if you can remind us what criteria pollutants are, that would be <laughs> Sure. Does anyone at the table know more about air pollutants? Okay, so criteria pollutants are uh, a concept under federal air quality. Um, so criteria air pollutants are pollutants for which acceptable levels of exposure can be determined and for which ambient air quality standards have been set by the EPA. So examples are ozone, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and particulate matter. Representative Sebelia. So the inclusion of this, does this 
change, uh, what measures would be eligible? Um, it wouldn't change uh, directly which, me which measures are eligible. It is adding this to the list of things that the PUC should keep an eye on um, after the program is running if there is any harm created because of increased use of the clean heat measures. Seems okay. Yeah, Representative Tori. I'm just wondering with the addition of criteria pollutants here, um, about the positive side of it. So reducing criteria pollutants uh, has a lot of benefits and the measures, some of the measures do that. Right. So I'm just wondering where, if we, this is so greenhouse gas focused. I'm just wondering where that value mm -hmm. reflected or assessed. Is that something that so I would say that the life cycle analysis that's going to be done for the measures uh, includes converting the emissions to carbon dioxide equivalent. So um, uh, eligible clean heat measures that release criteria pollutants, I think those would be converted to the carbon dioxide equivalent. Uh, those that have less of those would have a less. Um, so I don't think it'll be necessarily directly I don't know if it's directly addressed anywhere. Um, uh, although there's some, there are some sections that mention um, the PUC reviewing um, how this program is working towards achieving the emissions reductions. Um, and then also in the annual report, they have to report on some of the environmental impacts, I believe. But you, yes, there aren't too many sections that require a discussion of the positive benefits. Important. I think that this section is focused on the harmful, and I've had that thought before, so I'd like to not lose it and just think about where, where it makes the most sense to go. What's the name of Bongar? Just, just a discussion. This is a little bit indirect. We don't ever quite say that we want biofuels to be sustainably harvested in the first instance. Yes, we do. Didn't say it directly. It's the sustainably source, sustainably sourced biofuels is what it says. Okay. Okay. Yes. And this is just a reinforcement. Then. Yeah. Okay. Representative Logan. Um, thank you. Um, two things in this section. I, I will say that we have not defined what sustainability means, so that that does you know <clears throat> uh, mean that the PUC and the tag likely have to produce those definitions as part of the rulemaking process. It is a specific requirement of the tag. Right. Um, so uh, one thing I wanted to ask if we might be able to add to this section and review of consequences would be us, you know, uh, environmental injustice as defined in, what is that, three PSA? Six thousand and two, three, if two. Okay, maybe <laughs> I can check. Act one fifty four. Along the lines of public health, actually. Environmental burdens, maybe. Um, yeah. <coughs> Right, so that's the tag. Is this credit eligibility? Uh, well, so for any given emission heat measure, um, to review the consequences of that clean heat measure, yep. I think it makes sense to add. But I don't. You have a. You said environmental burdens. Yeah. 
Is that when you refer directly to the definitions in that section of statute? Well, sure. Yeah. So environmental burden is one is the defined term okay. in 6002. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. So are we, um, where would we put this? So if, is that another way of saying harmful consequences? Like, are, is that, are we trying to make harmful consequences more specific to? And also public health is. Yeah, public health is in here. And, and so it would be, you know, like public health, environmental burden. So the human, the human impact um, added to the review of consequences. Okay. And it's covered in other places, but just to be thorough. And th this was specifically requested in terms of um, there might be another place where it would be helpful to add, but in considering sort of like a, a far flung consequences right. Right. of a particular a, a particular measure because this says in Vermont or elsewhere. Okay, Ellen, do you have what you need to add that? Sure, did you want me to read you the definition of environmental burdens? Sure. Uh, so environmental burden means any significant impact to clean air, water, and land, including any destruction, damage, or impairment of natural resources resulting from intentionally or reasonably foreseeable causes. The definition goes on to list a number of examples. I don't know if you remember, uh, another eight lines of examples. So, uh, so I didn't know if that fits your purpose or you were thinking of something else. Getting there as best as I can. Yes. Yeah, not environmental justice, but environmental burden. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it could, well, mm. we could it's also environmental justice, though. I it think could be environmental justice. Yeah, actually, a specific example that I'm thinking of. So environmental justice means all individuals are afforded equitable access to and distribution of environmental benefits, equitable distribution of environmental burdens, and fair and equitable treatment and meaningful participation in decision-making processes, including the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And it goes on further, but that's the, the main part of it. Yeah, Thank you. I'm, that is a little um, awkward, especially since it discusses uh, meaningful participation in decision-making process since we're refer referring to in Vermont or elsewhere. So environmental burden is probably the best fit. The best. Okay. Yep. Well, I was just going to suggest that maybe it should be first before public health. Well, there's one more thing. And would this be a good place to add? I mean, it, increased emissions of criteria pollutants does seem to get at this a bit, but um, similar to creation of new methane to meet fuel demand. Um, also, take into consideration the expansion of the production of unsustainable liquid biofuels or unsustainable biofuels. Representative Sevilla, do you have a lot on that? Does uh, that change? What does that change? Hopefully, since the bill requires sustainably sourced biofuels, uh, they'll be reviewing for that. Um, but well, as a clean heat measure, sustainable biofuels are a clean heat measure. But it could have 
uh, development of a market for biofuels in the state could have the unintended consequence of the expansion of the production of unsustainable biofuels that are sold into the state, not for the purposes of retiring clean heat credits. So I would just add that this entire subsection was created in response to the inclusion of biofuels in this bill. Mm -hmm. I think so. Uh, and so deforestation, right? Damage to watersheds, right? Um, conversion of grasslands. The original terms, I think, were intended to get at some of the issues that could be caused by unsustainable biofuel sources. But yep. Yep. I don't know if there's other aspects of that you're thinking about in that. Absolutely. Actually, I think after a moment of reflection, the question that Kate, uh, that Representative Logan was asking is if this was the appropriate place to put that assessment in. And I think we're still in the credits. And I think the next section is the tag. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we talked about maybe having some sort of us understanding. Okay. Thank you. If there was, if necessary. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Representative Simmons. Sure. And I'm just hoping that we can definitely maybe try to find a place to identify um, that there is some valuation of the public health benefits from some of these measures as opposed to just, mm. not just, I don't mean just, but as opposed to, we're, we're doing a good job at like reeling in right. concerns, but I want to make sure that we're also recognizing that some of these measures, yeah. Absolutely. Well, great. That segues to the next section, I think. Great. Not the next, next section, but the next section. Actually, strike what I just said. That's coming up, I think. <laughs> There's more about public health later in the bill. Um, so on page 29, there's a change that you've already discussed in the, uh, so for credit registration, so the system for credit registration, down on line 15, um, shall require entities to submit the following information to receive the credit, the location of the clean heat measure, whether the customer or tenant has low income or moderate income, the type of property where the clean heat measure was installed or sold, the type of clean heat measure, and any other information required. So as it came over from the Senate, it had that language in blue. Last, the last version was customer income amount, and so this is going back to the original. Yes. Thank you. Uh, is the fuel dealer going to be responsible to know if the customer or tenant is a low or moderate income individual? Um, so not necessarily the fuel dealer. Uh, the one who installs uh, clean heat measures who uh, are seeking to gain credit based on it coming from a low income or moderate income customer will have to know that information. Who might that be, for example? anyone doing clean heat installation work. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Our folks we have a ways to go. I'd like to get as far as we can. Um, if we need a break right now, might mean we go a little past now. Or you want to soldier through. Okay, we're gonna keep going. Okay. All right, so on page 30, so now we're in the section about the tag. So first, there is a, a small change down in subparagraph three, but I think this is one of the topics of discussion. So subparagraph three, the duties of the tag include periodically assessing and reporting to the commission on the sustainability of the production of clean heat measures by considering factors including greenhouse gas emissions, carbon sequestration and storage, human health impacts, land use changes, ecological and biodiversity impacts, groundwater and surface water impacts, air, water, and soil pollution, and impacts on food costs. Yes. So, uh, sorry, I don't know if I was recognized, Madam You Chair. were recognized, Representative Sebelia. Uh So, might this be the place to add in the language that Representative Logan have been asking about earlier around really the expansion. unintended market impacts. Um, because this, well, this is specifically assessing and reporting 
to the PUC on the sustainability of the production of clean heat measures. So this is, this is a whole section that is about the clean heat measures themselves, the impacts of the clean heat measures themselves. My concern is about the expansion of markets for biofuels that can't be used to retire clean heat credits. So we're requiring biofuels to be sustainably sourced. And so this is- In order to be considered a clean heat. Yep. And this is measure. assessing on the sustainability- Of the production. So of clean heat measures. measures. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think what I'm getting at is unintended market impacts. Bringing more biofuels in that don't <clears throat> our definition, but would be somehow supported by our use of this for this for this setting up this structure. So how would that happen? Um, you know, we can't restrict who sells products into Vermont. Um, so that's happening now. Absolutely. Yeah. So just as um, the use of biofuels becomes normalized. You could potentially get, you know, less environmentally beneficial biofuel cheaper. If I understood Simple. correctly, Representative Logan, I think what you were hoping to understand is what's happening to the biofuels markets yeah. as we're going on. Yeah. So what is the development? What is the potential growth? Um, what's happening there? Yeah, a market analysis biofuels market analysis. Yeah, just under, just having an understanding of that. And actually, yeah, yes. Can we um, hold it? I'm writing the cut down and keep going and keep looking for where it belongs. Yeah. Um, so on page 32, there is a change. Um, it starts at the bottom of 30, page 31. So members of the TAG shall be appointed by the commission and shall include the Department of Public Service, the Agency of Natural Resources, the Department of Health, and then parties who have expertise in the following areas. And it's adding public health impacts of air quality and climate change, uh, deforestation, and forest degradation. The people with expertise in those subjects are eligible to apply to be a member of the tag. And the Department of Health is a default member. Representative Logan, thank you. Could we also add environmental burden here? People who are experts in environmental burdens. Mm -hmm. So how about I read the whole list? So expertise in the follow one or more of the following areas, technical and analytical expertise in measuring life cycle greenhouse gas emissions, energy modeling and data analysis, clean heat measures and energy technologies, sustainability and non-greenhouse gas emission strategy, strategies designed to, to reduce and avoid impacts to the environment, public health impacts of air quality and climate change, delivery of heating fuels, land use changes, deforestation and forest degradation and climate change mitigation law, uh, law and policy, policy and law. Mm -hmm. add it. Okay, I think, I think it's fine to add that. I mean, it's just another criteria of seeing the definition from the environmental justice. So are they going to, it says, um, have expertise in more, they don't have to have, the tag doesn't have, does the tag have to have someone that is an expert in all of these? No. So I guess, is it expertise in mitigating environmental burdens? Yeah. Okay, so um, on page 33, 
Uh, all of Section 8129 is in blue. However, this language has not changed. This is putting the equity advisory group back in. However, on page 34, it's adding a sunset to the group. So the language of the group's tasks and then their um, make makeup is still intact and the same. And then uh, down at the bottom of page 34, subsection C, the equity advisory group shall cease to exist when the initial clean heat standard rules are adopted. Thereafter, the issues described in subsection A shall be reviewed by the commission in compliance with previous A chapter 72, which is the environmental justice chapter. Representative Sebelia? Yeah, these are, um, this is one of three places where Representative Logan has worked with the Office of Racial Equity to ensure we've kind of fine tuned this uh, with their previous testimony and the other language that we had in. So, yeah, a lot of work has gone. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Yes, the director signed off on this. Yes. All right, so on page 35, um, this is a change from the prior draft or that was in the prior draft. So um, this is on the check back provision in 8131. So the commission shall not file proposed rules of the secretary of state implementing the clean heat standard without specific authorization. So it's striking uh, orders. Okay, so then um, there's a change in section four. That's on page 36. So uh, this is on the, the greenhouse gas. So now we're not in the clean heat section anymore. What's is on the greenhouse gas inventory. So the Secretary of Natural Resources shall include a supplemental accounting in the Vermont greenhouse gas emissions inventory and forecast that measures the upstream and life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of liquid, liquid gaseous, solid, geologic, and bio, biogenic fuels combusted in Vermont. So... I think I asked, what is a sensitivity analysis? And now it's been struck. Um, remind us what the sensitivity analysis is versus the supplemental accounting. So I don't really, I, I'm probably not going to explain this clearly. So I don't, because I don't do this type of calculation. So my understanding is that a sensitivity analysis is a specific type of uh, analysis done to evaluate variables and assumptions, and it kind of measures like the margin of error based on the assumptions that are in the model. Uh, a supplemental accounting, I think, is instead of doing an analysis, it's just more data, uh, including the upstream life cycle, uh, upstream and life cycle emissions, uh, and then also including geologic and biogenic fuels. Representative Sibelia. So uh, uh, line six and seven make this language consistent with um, the climate action plan language. Sorry, 64 and 65 of the climate action. Yeah. Representative Bonger. Just so I know, what is it, what is it um, measures upstream and life cycle greenhouse? They, they kind of sound the same to me. What's the, what does upstream mean versus life cycle? I don't know. Upstream, it's life cycle greenhouse. Life cycle greenhouse. <coughs> upstream, yeah. So it's, it's kind of redundant. <laughs> but, but it's consistent with yes. what's there. Yes. It's fun with, it's, yeah. Yeah. All right. I think we've done section five. We did section five, yes. Well, that's true. Goodness. <laughs> okay. So on page 37, there's changes in uh, first in section six in the facilitator section. Uh, yes, and this, so this uh, also relates to the Office of, Asia, Office of Racial Equity work that Representative Logan worked on. So facilitator, 
The commission shall hire a third party consultant with expertise in equity, justice, and diversity to design and conduct public engagement. The commission and the facilitator shall incorporate the guiding principles for a just transition into the public engagement process. The commission may use funds appropriated for hiring the consultant. The uh, public engagement shall be conducted by the facilitator for the purposes of, and this language hasn't changed, supporting the commission and assessing whether customers will be equitably served by clean heat measures and how to increase equity and in delivery of clean heat measures, identifying actions needed to provide customers low income and moderate income to better service and to mitigate fuel price impacts calculated in 8128, recommending any additional programs, incentives, or funding needed to support customers with low income and moderate income and organizations that provide social services to Vermonters in affording heating fuel and other heating expenses. And providing information to the commission on the challenges renters face in equitably assessing, accessing clean heat measures and recommendations to ensure that renters have equitable access to clean heat measures. So this is setting up that uh, during the public engagement process, the public engagement uh, facilitator will have special expertise in this area of uh, justice and equity and inclusion. Uh, they will specifically work on looking at these issues. Uh, the, the equity advisory group will also come into existence and look at the initial um, development of the rules. And then once the rules are adopted, the PUC will be uh, monitoring these issues uh, based on the climate, uh, based on the environmental justice work that's required under statute. Um, and so then related to that, at the top of page 39, um, Uh, at the top of page 39, the equity advisory group was struck in the previous draft, and so it's being back, uh, added back in so that they're automatic participants in the proceeding, um, and they receive notice of the public meetings uh, and opportunities to comment. Uh, the next section on still on page 39, um, the public meetings uh, are open to everyone and there will be translation services available to those who attend. Uh, number four is language that had been previously struck but is back in again. So the commission shall invite organizations and communities recommended by the equity advisory group to participate in the public meetings. Thank you. This is one piece that seems a bit redundant. Okay. Since there were this, this other list for the facilitator. Okay. Is everybody else comfortable with removing this responsibility from the equity advisory group? Number four. Number four. I mean, they mission. This is for the commission. <clears throat> well, they have to take recommendations from the equity advisory group. So then oh. the equity advisory group has to make have to make decisions. Oh. But we've already said who should be that the facilitator should be doing that. Yeah, yeah, keep doing that. Yeah, okay. fine with taking that out. Yeah. Um, next, in the advertising section, all advertisements of public meetings shall include notice of language assistance services. The commission shall arrange for language assistance to be provided to members of the public as requested using language ser the services of professional language services companies. Right. Uh, so on page 41, so now we're in the check back revision. Um, there was a request to add on the list uh, at the top of page 41, the filing shall include everything that is required under the following sections. So it's adding back in B and C. Um, this I think it, it's fine. It, it makes sense to add these back if you want them to. B and C detail the, the specific requirements of what's in the economic analysis and what's in the environmental analysis required under the APA. Um, so I think it was probably already covered under one of the other provisions, but I know that there are a lot of cross-references in here. So adding that 
makes it extra clear. Um, uh, then in subsection four, uh, so once adopted, any amendments to the clean heat standard shall be made in accordance with the Administrative Procedure Act, unless the adopted rules allow for amendments through the different process in accordance with 20, uh, 8126. Um, down in funding, uh, on or before February 15th, 2024, the commission shall report to the General Assembly on suggested revenue streams that may be used or created to fund the commission's administration of the Clean Heat Standard Program and shall include programs to support market transformation, such as workforce development, market uplift, and training that may be administered by a third party. So that'll come back in the report with their recommendations on that. Okay, right, and then uh, finally, the last one is on page 42, and this is part of the check back report. So in addition to the other elements of the check back report, um, down on line 10, the report shall recommend any legislative action needed to address enforcement or other aspects of the clean heat standards, including how to ensure fuel used for non-thermal uses is not impacted under the program. Smith. Thank you. Could you explain that a little bit? Uh, I think there's clear intent in the clean heat standard program for it to be limited to thermal fuel and thermal uses. Um, but you have, I think, heard testimony that uh, fuels are used for non for both thermal and non-thermal uses. And so while there's no intent to uh, capture non-thermal uses, this is asking the PUC to report back on how to ensure that they're not being swept up in that. Primarily, those would be sort of transportation. Off Crossover. Non-road yeah. uh, vehicles that use diet diesel. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ellen.